Today's webinar is sponsored by the Society of Decision Professionals. We will begin with the, the main, our topic this, this morning is with David Matheson. Embedded Decision Analysis, and this is one of the Best of That 2013 series. I would like now to introduce you to the speakers you will be hearing from today. Our featured speaker for today is David Matheson. David is the co-founder, president, and CEO of SmartOrg. He has helped senior management of firms in the United States and Europe improve their results from portfolio management, product development, innovation, R&D, capital investment, and strategy. He is co-author of the best-selling book, The Smart Organization, Creating Value Through Strategic R&D. David is currently a member of the board at Fotozini and a fellow with the Society of Decision Professionals. Dave, welcome to today's learning exchange. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and my mom's real proud. <laughs> Our moderator for today's presentation is Jay Anderson. Jay is currently a senior research fellow in the Department of Strategic Competitive Intelligence at Eli Lilly and Company. He was instrumental in the design and application of the R&D portfolio process and was a portfolio consultant for senior management for 17 years. Jay is a fellow and a board member of the Society of Decision Professionals. Jay, welcome to today's learning exchange. Thank you, Hilda. It's good to be here. Jay will facilitate your questions throughout the presentation and raise them to our speaker to address live during and at the end of the webinar. And now, without any further delay, I'd like to turn today's presentation over to our featured speaker, David Matheson. David, you have the floor. Thank you, Hilda. Um, I want to start with uh, maybe a little story about myself. I have a, what I believe is a unique distinction in the decision analysis community, which is I'm the world's first or perhaps only second generation decision analyst. Uh, my father, Jim Matheson, was a pioneer in the field. And uh, in a way, decision analysis is in my blood. I grew up um, around this community and, and seeing that it had a big impact. Uh, and early in my career, I had the opportunity to work on a uh, nuclear reactor decision. Um, and when I saw our decision appear in the, our recommendations appear in the newspaper, um, I was just, it was, I was hooked. It was clear that, that we could have a massive, uh, massive impact as a community and that this technology really meant something and it mattered and it was important. Um, and I have been at it, really, for 30 years, uh, trying to help this community move forward. Uh, I am ago, and uh, uh, I think, in a way, my child's vision has not been fulfilled. And, of course, you'd expect a lot of that uh, as a naive kid, seeing kind of what was going on. But I think it runs deeper than that. Um, over my career, I've seen other management trends and ideas have more profound impact on society than decision analysis has. Uh, as an example, um, I was a kid, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, and I did a lot with computers. Some of the kids I uh, played with were being taught this new computer language on this crazy new um, computer, uh, something called Smalltalk. It was the Alto computer at Xerox Park, And that's an idea that not only had impact, but also changed the world. And so it's pretty clear that as a decision analyst, we can, we can certainly make livings and have a good living and, and work on important, interesting problems, but, but can we change the world? And it boils down to a question of how big an idea is decision analysis really? And <clears throat> I don't mean in terms of its ability to have an impact, which is clearly big and, and one of the reasons I'm here, but in a way its ability to scale. And so my purpose today is to enroll you in a new vision for decision analysis for the 21st century. Um, it's something I can see only dimly, and I need a lot of help, and I think this community is just the community to help figure out how we're going to become a thriving force in the 21st century, stay relevant, and ultimately change the world. So I have a view of that. It's, I'm, I'm calling it at the moment embedded decision analysis, and um, uh, I look forward to uh, any interactions and questions that Jay may be moderating and so on, because I think this is really the beginning of a conversation. I should also uh, say sort of administratively, I have to, if you're onto Twitter, um, at SmartArgInc and hashtag decision management are good places to, uh, to interact or contribute, and we'll get a little record from there. 
So that's, uh, that's my purpose. Let me start with a question of scale, because I have a, a sort of hypothesis here. I'm pretty sure it's true. But let me just ask you guys, as a way of getting started and as fellow members of the communities, what's the largest scale instance that you have been directly involved in for decision analysis? And so the number of people involved, and what I mean here, people mean somebody directly involved in the decision process somehow, that is providing information, creating alternatives, et cetera. I want to explicitly exclude those affected by the decision. Clearly, a major decision can have uh, impact on thousands and thousands of people. But I mean the, the people really working it as a decision problem. So um, people are voting away here, I can see. And uh, I'm going to show the polls here. Oh, sorry, hit the wrong button. Get up. All right. Um, Maybe I need your help, Hilda. Doesn't, not doing what I – there we go. Results are shown. Okay. So uh, put in your last vote. And um, let's close the polls. And so, you know, we're talking about the largest processes here. So I'd expect these numbers to be big. 30% uh, or so are around 10 people, which is essentially a team. 50 people is maybe a couple teams interacting, 100 people, a lot of people uh, interacting. And you can, you can see these larger numbers, 500, 1,000, 5,000, um, are only a few people um, have, have participated in one that big. Uh, so this, the largest one people have been involved in tends to be sort of project management size is, is clearly the vast uh, majority of this are a project. Now let's look at another question here, closely related. Um, which is how many decisions were directly in play. So if you think of, as a, as a metaphor, the decision hierarchy, and I mean the decisions that are in the middle part, the strategy part that you're really focusing on, you're really working. Of course, a good decision analysis does have a lot of um, uh, impact on downstream decisions, but I'm talking about the ones that are really in the, in the focus that you're really working. So uh, go ahead and vote here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show these polls. And you can see the largest people have worked on by, uh, what is it, approximately 80% is 10 decisions or less on that order. This is obviously a scale question. A couple people have worked up at the 500 or 1,000 kind, of, um, kind of decisions. And so those are, the, those are the bigger ones. And it seems to me that... Uh, those big numbers need to get routine if we're going to change the world. Uh, and this is a question I ask myself <clears throat> from time to time. Decision analysis is a management method or a trend. And, uh, you know, what should we aspire to? Well, accounting. Accounting was invented as a management method. And it's, if I think of management methods, it's probably on the short list for the most prevalent on the planet. And uh, not that we would be that in a mere few decades, but uh, we'd be nice to be on that trajectory, um, moving towards something that has that big an impact. Uh, and um, so why is decision analysis not as prevalent as accounting? Or maybe more um, pointedly, why is it not moving in that direction? And there are certainly lots of reasons. Um, and so if we, if we just back off a little bit from maybe that standard and say, okay, have we made it to a list of management fads? There are a lot of things that, that work our way through organizations. I went to the Wikipedia page on management fad, and this is a list of uh, generally discredited or partially discredited um, things that swept the business world and have been discarded, left behind, or are broken. Uh, they, uh, these ideas all obviously have um, uh, important contributions to make to management, so I don't really mean to be dismissive, dismissive of them, except to say that we haven't even made the list. So, well, David, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I suppose that's true. <laughs> I suppose that's true. But uh, in terms of changing the world, um, you know, we haven't even gotten gotten a shot. If you look at something like total quality management, that I think is an idea that has been generated and has spawned off lots of ideas. The core idea in there remains strong, even if this particular trend is, is there. So certainly it's good we haven't been discarded, but I don't think we've even been a contender, I guess would be another way of putting it. 
Um, so why is this? Uh, many reasons, but I think one of the real fundamental elements, and this is a bit of a sacred cow, um, is that our profession has fundamentally a weak value proposition. Uh, what we offer people is good decisions. Our goal is decision quality. We make a significant deal about how decisions are distinct from outcomes, and I really accept all of that. Um, but that, in a way, is a weak value proposition. I have been in selling situations against other methods, and the other methods promise results. I, I think, in a way, we're more honest, but what people really want is results. And, and what I have seen is that when, when I go and talk to people about good decisions, unless I'm very, very careful, what I communicate to them is that I'm not on their side. That is, they say they want better results, better profit, or whatever, and I say, well, what you need is good decisions, and I have to make the distinction between decisions and outcomes, and what they hear is, this guy is not on my side. He is not as committed as I am to results. Um, and now the idea that, that, that you can only do as well as you can do and that you may not get the results you're committed to, um, I think is, is a perfectly ordinary idea that everybody accepts. We don't have to teach people that. So part of this is our language and part of it is um, fundamentally what we take kind of responsibility for and what we're committed to as a partner with the people we want to serve. So um, it's a weak value proposition, basically. And so one of the steps is we've just got to get completely committed to delivering the results people want. And, and to say we only do good decisions is, is in a way a cop-out um, from the point of view of the people that we serve and the impact we're trying to have. So uh, I look at, well, what, what has been successful as management trends in the time frame I've been watching? And um, I think just looking, uh, it's pretty easy to see we've been outclassed in a way by algorithms. So uh, you can pick your favorite computer-based decision buzzword, predictive analytics, business intelligence, big data. You put anything you want in there. They're all promising good decisions. They're all promising better results. And they're all changing the world in a way that we're not. And, and we've got so much more to offer than some of these things. Um, so, so what can we do? I'm a little sort of depressed in a way, um, but I think it's very instructive to, uh, to really be honest about how, how we're doing as a profession and to also realize this thing about decision quality, it's critically important, but it's also something we create and in a way that gives us a possible way forward. And indeed, I think about what is the really biggest impact of decision analysis that I know and I would have to say the best one I can think of is spam filtering, um, which I find a little jarring, in fact, because it's not the sort of decision analysis that I think of when I think of decision analysis. But, in fact, there are folks trained by Ron up at uh, Microsoft who have implemented um, spam filtering methods, and it's got to be the largest scale impact applications of decision analysis. Uh, I think this would be a contender with in terms of value added to the world, uh, just it's a huge, huge thing. And of course, they're doing billions and billions and billions of little micro decisions. It's all automated. And this got me thinking that the decision analysis and spam filtering is not very obvious. You really have to look in deeply. And for me, I think that's a clue as to what the way forward is. And so this is this thing I'm calling embedded decision analysis. How do we scale decision analysis? It's through embedding it into a business process in such a way that it becomes routine and the decision analysis, in a way, disappears into the background, maybe the way it does in spam filtering as, an, as a kind of analogy. Now, um, to show this is not just a crazy idea, I'd like to show you a, a amp actual implementation. This is the largest scale decision analysis that I've been involved in. Um, this was presented at the Stanford Portfolio course a couple years ago, um, and uh, the title of this is Delivering a Billion Dollars, and I think it starts right there, uh, which is in the presentation, this was given by the, uh, the basically the process owner, they, 
he starts with a complete commitment to results and impact of the results. Um, I don't see this in too many decision analysis kind of rec recommendations or case studies or so on. And then um, he presents the problem in terms of the business realities that they're facing. So here we see uh, Dow AgriScience being outspent in R&D on the left and not achieving very high project successes um, uh, of their, uh, their promise and their estimation. And then they did an intervention around portfolio management and uh, they measured their improved performance. So in spite of underspending their competitors, they are uh, number three in new losses, and uh, their process, which is called CPS, create product project success. Uh, you can see after they implemented that, they have a much higher um, success rate for their projects. So that's really framed in terms of delivering the business result, and uh, the quip they make is that uh, half of portfolio management is how much you spend, and half of portfolio management is where you spend it. And the where you spend it question is a very decision-intensive process. It's a very natural one. But notice the decision analysis hasn't yet peered. Um, as he moves on his, in his presentation, I'm going to skip a whole lot of it, he gets to essentially what's the business process. And uh, let me start here on the left. If you look at the business problem they face, there's, uh, they have about, uh, this is Dow AgriScience, they're making agricultural chemicals, new kinds of seeds, um, that kind of thing on a global basis. And they have um, perhaps uh, a hundred, a couple hundred active ingredients, sort of biological angles that they are working and trying to see if they could make those work um, to develop new products. Those work differently in dozens of different kinds of crops and are sold, uh, everything from, sorry, corn to uh, wheat, uh, which have completely different sort of biology systems in, and then are sold in uh, dozens, um, I think many dozens of markets around the world. So, for example, Northern Europe and Southern Europe are quite distinct because they have different agricultural cycles. And uh, Southern Europe and South Africa are quite distinct because they have very different regulatory and um, business kind of uh, environments. So it's a massive, massive portfolio problem. At the time this was done, it was, uh, they have some funny language, but think of this as 1,500 units in their in their portfolio, they call those concepts, projects, or aggregations of these. It's just strange language, but 1,500. This has since grown to about 3,000. Now, their teams, um, what they've got is uh, central executive management, uh, and this is where we usually think of decision analysis as living. But they have uh, global project leaders then. Uh, there are hundreds of these people around the, the country managing different project areas, and then many hundreds of the local teams who are thinking about the information to be involved. And one of the things they did was they changed how the local information gets assessed in the first place, going from point estimates to more uncertainty and ranges and sort of baked it into the process. And lastly, we get to the tools. What are the tools that are needed in this area? And uh, you'll recognize many of these pictures, and he's got a whole slide on this. So what they realized was that portfolio management is not project management, and it needs a different set of tools. Um, and so decision analysis and sensitivity and, and these sorts of things we're all familiar with. So the thing about this is that it's, a, um, it's the la decision analysis comes last. And I think that's probably right. It's the process orientation and the result orientation that makes this possible. And they're doing approximately 3,000 simultaneous decision analyses on a global basis uh, every year, maybe a couple times because there are updates and so on. Uh, and they're is almost not a decision analysis analyst in sight. It's been designed and baked into the process. So that's an example of what I mean by um, decision analysis, uh, by, by kind of in, uh, thinking about it in terms of embedding as opposed to doing as a consultant. So this might be a good time to pause for any um, questions. Now that gives some examples here. Jay? Uh, yes, uh, David, um, what did you say by its very nature, this portfolio uh, management portfolio analysis lend itself towards embedded decision analysis than other more traditional one-off project consultations? Uh, yeah, I think uh, d definitely. Um, and I would almost define a one-off project consultation as to not be embedded decision analysis. Um, I would, uh, but I, I, I would ask the 
is the one-off consultation really a special case? So the portfolio process is easy to see um, that it's a many, many decisions. And it's a repeatable process as well. A company that wants to do portfolio management doesn't just want to do it once and then they'll say, okay, well, everything's fixed. They want to continue on and do it over and over again. Yes, yes. So many one-off projects that I have encountered <laughs> are sitting inside a sort of organizational system in which they're one example of many. Even though there isn't sort of an explicit portfolio, there is a, a process in play um, maybe an example, that, oh, just, just what I'm very familiar with, is, uh, is product development. Um, so lots of companies do their product development and drive decisions at their stage gates, go, no, go, and direction decisions. And these decisions happen over and over and over again, even though there isn't a portfolio. Uh, so, so I would agree portfolio is a great example, and it's sort of the easiest to understand. The point I'm trying to make, I'd like to go well beyond the scope of a, of a portfolio. Okay. Yeah, does that address the question, do you think? Yes, I think it does. Okay. So what can I learn from this? And I, I think if from that initial poll, some of the largest, I mean, this is a project measured in thousands of decisions uh, and uh, many hundreds, 500 to 1,000 people involved. So it's on the top of those scales I put in before. And there are a couple other examples of this, I think, in this community. Um, which, by the way, I would love to hear more about um, some other time, uh, but I, I think it's really great to collect great examples. So, so where does the future of our, our profession lie? So I've looked at um, a couple different elements of this, and I think we started as a profession up here essentially in strategy. High-impact decisions, they need a lot of careful attention. They're only going to happen once. And that's a great place, right? And, uh, and the profession has moved over the years into major projects, typically capital investment sorts of ones, um, but there are many major projects that maybe are a level below strategy or business unit strategy. They're still high impact. There are a little bit more of them. And it's cousin um, uh, portfolio management, I think, to the point of the question there, which gives you more decisions. And depending on how you define it, they can be big or small, because certainly the portfolio is as high impact as any major project may be higher, even if the individual decisions in it are maybe a little smaller. And so depending on your industry or uh, size, then portfolio management has been a it, it, it has a lot of a lot of impact and a lot of decisions. And then there's this sort of gap, as far as I've been able to tell. And then we jump out to things like decision quality training. So there's certainly there are plenty of training organizations, and they do a great job um, building awareness, and they impact probably a lot more decisions, uh, but have a lot less like dollar change attributable, and people forget, and so on. Uh, and then as we move off to um, the spam filtering sorts of examples, that, you know, I've got a little break in my scale. This breaks the scale. It's just a couple orders of magnitude higher in terms of the number of decisions, although the impact on any individual one is, is really quite low. The aggregate is, is really impressive. So I say, all right, well, this is the space impact against scale, number of sides. So what's, what's happening? What's my read of the competitive forces or the trends in each of these areas. Well, I, I think strategy um, has been claimed by premier consulting firms. Uh, there's certainly enough room for decision analysts to, to make a living up here, um, but we're not the special offering we once were, and I think we're being beaten competitively. That is, decision analysis alone is insufficient to be a great strategy firm. Um, in McKinsey Quarterly, I see articles coming out about decision making. They're getting the technology. The Kahneman and Tversky stuff is becoming known. Um, this, I think, is an area for some people to make a living. It's not a way we're going to change the world. So then I go to, okay, uh, many firms, I'm sure on this uh, call, um, are doing major projects in their organizations or portfolio management. This is the domain of internal consultants. Uh, well, also some consulting firms, so they're external ones too. But uh, it's another model of you have sort of the decision analyst specialist who's called upon to either run a process like a portfolio process or is standing in a, in a kind of stable to help with major projects. And this is great. And uh, as far as I can tell, this is saturated. Um, there was a period of time in the 90s where these organizations were very much on the rise. Uh, they've kind of 
stagnated overall. I, I don't know of a lot of new ones being created, and indeed some of them are falling backwards and losing, losing some traction. So again, there's a great opportunity to make a living for a lot of people here. I don't see the internal consulting model as changing the world, um, except in perhaps a few uh, select companies that can tackle the change management problems uh, around this. So then I say, okay, well, um, how about this training? Well, we've got a lot of tra traditional training and courses, uh, and that that's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't have a lot of impact. And then we're seeing a big change with MOOCs. This is massively online, and I'm going to forget the acronym, something courses. Um, but these are courses given to thousands or tens of thousands simultaneously, uh, and I know SDP has been sponsoring some of uh, experiments in this area. I think it's SDP that's been doing this. Uh, so we have a possibility of reaching a lot of people, and that's great. Individual decisions are low impact. And last are the smarter computers, and as I say, I think we're kind of losing out to predictive analytics and so on. So these are all the areas, and I, I look at all of these and say, wow, there's not a lot of maneuvering room here. Things have been tried. Uh, where do we go? What's the 20th first century going to be? Are we going to go fight against McKinsey? Are we going to try to rebuild internal consulting organizations and, and get that over the hump, do more training, um, and so on? And I, I just think there's got to be another way, and uh, I think it's – I'm calling that embedded decision analysis, and the example I gave you from Dow is – is kind of an example of this. So it's it's moderate impact decisions, sort of in the middle, um, certainly in aggregate, and then uh, we're trying to hit a lot of decisions. And the way that's done is by making decision analysis, in a way, disappear. It takes attention away from the consultant and onto the business processes in which the decisions are made. Um, and so think of any business process that has a lot of decisions in it. I would invite you to bring to mind a decision-intensive process and, and ask yourself, well, if you could get people to do decision analysis without even knowing they were doing it, so develop alternatives, maybe not all at once, but over the course of a process, or uh, to think in terms of uncertainties, or maybe at least ranges, and, and make decision analysis effectively happen, even though there isn't a consultant and a project around it. And um, that's, that's the basic idea, this, this future I can see dimly. Um, so let me just uh, ask another question of you to ground this. Many of you are at, at companies. And if you thought, if, if you could take one of your business processes and increase the business intelligence uh, around, a, or maybe the decision intelligence around decision analysis and make it effectively happen inside the process so that every decision made was being done to a high quality standard. Where would that make a big difference for your company? So I've listed some common um, decision intensive processes here and I just want to get a sense of where you guys think the, uh, the impact really is. So this is also a little out of the zone where, uh, you know, the, the consultant doesn't have to do everything in this model. So I can see we're still uh, jumping around here. Um, let me share the results. I think they're settling down. So uh, about 35% of you say capital investment or capital stewardship. These are called different things in different organizations, of course. Um, there's uh, an, The second one is R&D, innovation. Uh, new product development, uh, whatever process you want to call that. Planning and budgeting could use some better decisions. Pr uh, product management, marketing, and demand forecasting and capacity planning. So there's really quite a distribution here. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure how much this represents the world and how much this represents the audience. I suspect we have a lot of oil and gas folks on the, f on the phone for whom capital investment, capital stewardship sorts of processes are, are very big. So, so what can what can we do? How do we make that happen? Is this going to be a, a a huge change management slog where we're fighting an uphill battle every step? I do notice that the uh, the algorithm guys uh, are getting into a lot of these processes easier. They show up with data. Um, Google has actually made this a kind of criteria, which is we we make data driven decisions. That's code for we have to do a better job, and let's let the evidence help us decide as opposed to the ego. 
Um, and they bring a lot of data to bear and a lot of evidence, and I think they're very much aligned with what we're trying to accomplish, but they're doing it in kind of a different way. Um, so what what is it? Where is there is there is there really hope for us in a way? And I think, of course, there is. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Um, but we really have some great strengths. Um, decision analysts, we have all spent a lot of time thinking deeply about the structure of decisions and about the human processes. I, I encounter some of these algorithm folks, and, and they're just they're just down the right knee. I mean, they have some great ideas, but um, in terms of understanding what it really takes to get, get somebody over the hump and to, to make a decision, what kinds of information are really relevant and what kinds are. I mean, we're just light years ahead of these things. Uh, the second thing is that if you look at us from a system point of view, um, many of these sort of algorithmic things out there are essentially data manipulation. That is, you take a database, you add it up different ways, you filter. You could think of a lot of it as a gigantic pivot table. Um, well, that's not entirely fair, but I think it sort of directionally uh, makes the point. In contrast, our models or our approach to analysis is much more modeling uh, a decision analysis. It's much more active. It really focuses very much on the issues that matter in terms of a decision. And these are, these are great, great strengths. Um, and I think that we can make a contribution to the world through these things. We also have some great weaknesses. And uh, this is good news and bad news. Uh, we have these weaknesses, and and the thing is, I think most of them are self-imposed. And perhaps this is the hardest kind of weakness to overcome, because scaling is going to require us to shift our thinking. And I think a lot of this flows from this very first before. Uh, that is, we have this view of the decision analysis consultant. There was a time in my career when I wanted to to be the guy on stage and and I got a lot of um, juice, I guess, out of uh, you know being really involved and, and having a visible role and all that and being a consultant. And I think that is where uh, a lot a lot starts. That is one of the things that's in our way. It's not a very empowering message for others, and um, I think we've got to. That that role has found its place. It's always going to have a place. It's important sometimes to have people intervene in situations. That's not going to go away, but that's not going to scale decision analysis. We have to move to an embedded DA thinking in which we say, how can the decision analyst disappear? How can I become more of a designer uh, of a, a process or a flow and less of um, a person carrying out a project? Uh, the before... The consultant is sort of intervention-based. I show up in a situation, and I make a difference. The after is this is the ordinary business process. It's already done in an ordinary way by ordinary people. Another, I think, big shift is from a decision focus. This goes with the intervention. What do we have to decide now? To a learning focus, which is how does the process find its way to make great decisions over time and ultimately deliver great results? The before is one time, the after is iterative and ongoing. Um, there's another major cluster of things about how we think about information. Before, uh, we can rely on experts, and the uh, sort of theory of decision analysis says, well, you get an expert and you make some careful assessments, and in a way that's a cop-out because it puts the burden of proof on the expert. We've got to think more about how, how we can create a process that consumes and provides the right kind of data based on good enough assessments. Um, we have to shift from decision analysis and decision quality to how those things help evaluation and critical thinking and move from power tools for specialists, which is where the community has been, to scalable tools for non-decision analysis users. That is, instead of designing tools for us, we need to design tools for them that carry the decision analysis through. And ultimately, that's a shift from a focus on good decisions to creating valuable results. So we have lots of lots of um, weaknesses here. We create them ourselves, and I think a, a shift of thinking will help move this forward. Let me uh, hit the scariest shift. I already talked about this a little bit, going from the decision analysis consultant, this is a highly specialized person, intervening in a situation to facilitate a group 
to a great decision as measured by decision quality. Embedded decision analysis, ordinary people doing routine work drive their organizations to great decisions as measured by great results. And so this is a pretty profound uh, shift of the role of decision analysis and our role as decision analysts in changing the world. Another shift I think that goes with this, <clears throat> and this is a bit of a sacred cow, is to shift away from the decision focus and reframe it to learning. So I have been taught, and I have certainly done, this is the party problem here on the left, that you want to make a, a model of the decision at hand and correct, create a careful tree structure and get all the probabilities and develop the whole thing so I can really get down to what's the best decision. Uh, one of the things I learned is that if my recommendation rests on the subtleties of a probabilistic argument, nobody's going to care. It just it becomes very, very, very difficult to get across to, to decision makers and to convince people to actually change. Um, I do think that that this, uh, and also that the focus on decisions is tied to the intervention model. That is, when you show up, there's a decision that has to be made, and if you let go of the intervention model, you see a continuous stream of decisions made, and people and organizations are value-seeking, um, and, and decisions are sort of the currency. So this, this shifts, I, I would put the decisions in the background and bring to the foreground the learning focus, and I say all this as a committed decision analyst, we have some incredibly powerful tools for helping people learn. We have ways of mapping out choices. We have ways of mapping out uncertainty that helps people and organization learn and improve over time. So I have a little metaphor here of uh, these ships going out across the ocean uh, to discover the unknown land. Um, and so we're all sailing in the undiscovered country of the future. And we've got to learn about how to thrive in the future. So that's, that's my metaphor. Uh, decision analysts have a great compass. Expected NPV, and of course there's a tree calculation in there, but um, expected NPV or variations of this metric um, give you a, a way of steering, you, a way of knowing if you're improving, a way of integrating many, many considerations into a kind of compass that tells you whether or not you're headed the right direction. Um, a the, the kinds of plans, moving to the boats, many people make, and organizations make plans that tend to be very rigid. Uh, they have certain milestones and they track accountability of the plans. The kinds of options we can lay out in contrast are quite different. Something like the strategy table really maps out a space uh, of choice where people can make different choices downstream. They understand what the big levers are, what the small issues are. Um, and uh, instead of being a very fragile plan that has to get redone, um, a strategy table for me is a very plucky boat that is going to withstand lots of changes and be able to make its way through. It's not that I'm picking the specific strategy, although it's good to have a plan A. It's that I have multiple strategies I can be thinking about and gathering evidence on and, and choose which ones I'm going to commit to and which ones I'm going to let slide for a bit. And lastly, the map. What's the map of a future look like? What's the content of a map of the future? The content of a map of physical geography is mountains and rivers and plains and things like that. I think the content of a map of the future is uncertainty. And the tornado diagram is just a wonderful metaphor. And for me, is sort of the touchstone um, of the example. Uh, that, that we can really work to help drive learning. When somebody sees a tornado diagram, they start inventing new options that drive the upside. They start doing things that help prevent the downside. They change their focus of attention from the stuff that doesn't matter to what matters. And so it functions very like, much like a map of the future for people to help drive discovery, development, and, and learning to find, uh, make great decisions and ultimately drive great results. Now, let me pause here. I think there's another question. Uh, yes, David. Uh, one of our, our listeners posed the following question. Given human psychological weaknesses in making decisions, embedding DA into a process can only go so far in creating good decisions and valuable results. Shouldn't embedding DA into how we do things transition the DA consultant into the DA coach, that is, someone who doesn't go away, who guides the organization in their learning and their thinking? 
Um, yeah, I think that that could well be fine. If I think of what's the role for us as decision analysts, I, I guess I, I was trying to make a point about fading away. Um, there is very much a role for coaches in these kinds of process. I think the thing is we can't be the keepers of the secret knowledge, um, which is uh, uh, the sort of strategy thinking that guy comes in and we have the special sauce we're going to use, but, but rather we're helping people deal with their practical problems. Um, and I think of a kind of 80-20 rule. If you design your decision, your embedded decision process for the 80% of decisions that are routine, we got a lot of value to add in the non-routine pro decisions. I think a lot of us spend, a, spend too much of our time in the routine elements of decision analysis, which is not a good use of our horsepower, or we become, or, or we become trapped in the special cases, which means that we can't scale. And so we have this sort of mm -hmm. dilemma: do we do we stick with the special cases that actually justify our our high-powered consulting capabilities, um, which doesn't scale, or do we deal with the routine, which becomes tedious and expensive and and doesn't work either? And I, what I'm saying, in a way, is we we can if we can embed a lot, we can handle the routine. We become coaches, and we do get called in for the hard ones. I, I really don't think. We're going to go away in that sense. It's just that uh, we need the whole picture to scale. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, let me give you an example of uh, of this. Um, this may be all um, very alien to you folks. So uh, I think there's a, this example uh, is from a guy called Bergelman who studied uh, Intel. And Intel made a very famous decision to get out of the memory business and focus on CPU. So you can see some memory chips and, and some CPU, a CPU there. And um, there is one version of the story that is Andy Grove got his top executives together and they did a strategy process and they made the brilliant choice to uh, dump um, memory and focus on 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 these uh, the CPUs and that's a that's a great story it's a hero story it feeds our egos if we're involved and um, it's it's one version of the truth I, I think it's a it's not a very powerful version of the truth. Uh, and Bergelman uh, really dug in, and he found that there's another story going on which I think has a lot more impact and, and in a way is a lot more instructive. The strategy of Intel was to be in both businesses, and, it, and they had a big emphasis on um, memory. And uh, they also had business processes around the allocation of capital, um, and these processes had various checkpoints and so on, but they were based fundamentally on metrics of uh, the profitability of capital utilization. And so mid-level managers were making decisions using this process about the allocation of their machines and so on. And so what happened is the DRAM business became less profitable because of various global trends. The middle management was already pulling out of this business in slow incremental steps, and they uh, they got less and less, and they were putting more and more em em emphasis on the CPUs, and this was really going against the stated strategy of Intel. Now, at some point, this kind of came to a head where the disconnect became pretty clear, and uh, at that point, Andy Grove got together uh, and sort of declared the obvious, made it official that that's the way they were going. But this has a couple really interesting elements, which is the, the people working in the business process were, in fact, much smarter than the top management in responding to reality. They were being driven by a process that made decisions incrementally so that all the commitments and all that work was already in flight and already going. So it was results seeking through a series of really, really good decisions. And the role of the top management was essentially to make it official and uh, scale it up. And there are many examples of this. I think another good one is uh, in, uh, when uh, Microsoft got out of, uh, got into the Internet. They were anti-Internet for a long time. And then one day, um, <clears throat> uh, Bill Gates declared that they were an Internet company. And overnight, they were. And that was possible because people at lower levels were already making them an Internet company. So um, what's... What's happening here is a is an accumulation of decisions that drives things as big as strategy. And if you look into the design of the process here around the, the capital investment and prioritization, was that process really a good one? Uh, I think in their case it was a bit haphazard. They did get a little lucky. And I think our capabilities can let us do much, much better. 
this does bring us to a new take on decision quality. Decision quality is wonderful, uh, but if you look at this process kind of orientation, um, we have uh, what decision analysts want is explicit alternatives. Embedded DA reframes this, so alternatives emerge and evolve. People start with a kind of half-baked alternative, they start to pursue it for a little while, they learn some new things, they change it, and the question for us is does the process produce an exploration of the alternative space in an efficient or reasonably efficient way? What decision analysts want is information based on careful expert assessments. Um, I think Embedded DA reframes this as how can we change the job so that the uncertain information is actually generated at its source. Um, so when people read all kinds of reports, they don't know what to do with it. And can we get upstream of that and make the assessments deal with ranges and probabilities of success and bake it in? Um, decision analysts want evaluation models that focus great detail on the complex issues for the particulars of the decision. And I think actually our clients do this too. People tend to make overly detailed models and they become kind of burdensome in their own. Uh, embedded DA reframes this as a simple modeling system to generate good results most of the time. The 80-20 rule I was alluding to in, in answering the previous question. What's a simple model that'll get you through many of the cases easily and actually drive behavior reserving the 20% of really difficult cases for people to actually intervene in and, and help out as coaches and advisors. Um, lastly, commitment is a big issue for decision analysts, and it's because we have this assumption that commitment follows the decision. Embedded DA reframes it. Committed action is already underway when the decision gets made. So um, we have this idea that the commitment follows, or that the commitment follows the decision and the action follows the decision. But in a process context where this is evolving over time and with multiple people, the action and the commitment can actually precede the decision. Um, and so this is a, a way, something that's a little hard to get your head around, but it really takes, makes a lot of the alignment issues we face much, much easier because you've already got the organization in motion in incremental steps through a process like I was giving you with the example of, um, of uh, Intel. So I am quite curious about this topic, and I would like to know who, who among us has seen um, cases of embedded DA or other large-scale decision analysis deployment. I mean, even if you don't exactly use my terms, um, some very large-scale one. Uh, I w I'm very interested in collecting some examples. <clears throat> And just to see here, who's done something like this? Who's maybe underway? Who would like to do one or just getting started? And who really isn't, isn't thinking this way at all? So I'm uh, showing the results here. So uh, approximately half of us really haven't thought this way or don't have an example. I would certainly invite you to think this way um, if, if you haven't, 20% uh, maybe have an opportunity they're interested in pursuing in this, um, and what, about 30% either have done one or have one underway or at some stage of, of maturity uh, with that. So that's great, um, and I would love to hear uh, about those examples. I believe there's a question. Uh, yes, uh, David, we actually have several questions. I'll, I'll put out one right now. I'll save the rest for Q&A. Okay. Um, uh, one of our listeners writes, I just exited a meeting where I proposed a DA process. The conversation was steered in a different direction by the senior manager. He became focused on the tools only. He kept discussing embedding DA tools, but without a dialogue decision process. Of course, this is a critical piece. What are your thoughts? Well, so um, let me distinguish the dialogue decision process from dialogue and decision making. The dialogue decision process um, if I, I'm going to make a, I'm going to use this, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit to make a point. Um, so uh, the dialogue decision process is a interventional process to get a group that's stuck through a dialogue through a complicated situation, and it's a, it's the process of making a strategic decision. So it's not an example of embedded DA. Now the, and in fact it's an interventionalist model. It's, you know, if I'd be really cynical, it's a way for a consultant to create a project so that they can manage, be managed as a project and have a scope of work and, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Now, yeah, I see where you're going. 
the, the idea of dialogue in a decision process is critical. Um, but I believe many of these processes already have dialogue built in. So it's a way of, it just goes by the name of project review or uh, status reports or whatever. And I think what we need to do is take this essential idea of dialogue and pack it into the process. So as an example, a lot of project management processes have dialogue around sort of project status, which is uh, run through a checklist of accomplishments to milestones. And the decision content isn't really in the dialogue. Well, this is a great opportunity for us to bring that decision content back into the dialogue, ask questions like who really needs to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, often these meetings become just sort of pylon meetings with everybody with any view to be there. And uh, that decision focus that we have can be injected to get the decision dialogue going in the context of a process in a meeting that's, that's going on. So we don't have to make a big deal out of it. We just have to... Um, deploy our knowledge of dialogue into an ordinary process and tune it up. And, and what I find is people are grateful for it. They're, they're, they actually feel stuck with uh, their inability to make decisions. And so in a way, it's, it's, again, it's our getting in our own way creates some of the problems. Gotcha. Address the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I want I have some concluding things, and then let's come to decision, uh, and we can come to more Q&A. Um, so why now? I mean, why wasn't embedded decision analysis uh, an idea when I was a kid? Um, and part of it is the, the field just hadn't matured enough. Uh, but I think there's a little bit more going on to this than, than just time. And I think this idea of embedded decision analysis, the time is right now because systems are transformational in enabling embedded decision analysis. <clears throat> and I actually think if we don't respond, these systems are going to render uh, uh, we're going to basically marginalize our community as a, as a, as a community. I'm, I'm very concerned that that might happen. So what you're seeing um, ultimately is all being driven by the picture on the lower right, increased computer power, but uh, going to the upper left, the Internet, the cloud, process automation, people are starting to run their businesses through systems that communicate globally in real time. And uh, this idea of always having a meeting and interviewing people, I mean, th those things happen but it's happening now in the context of stuff that's being done. And unless we can change the way these things are proceeding, the decision rules and processes are just going to get embedded into these systems, and they'll be something we're fighting against instead of something we've co-opted. Um, analytics and data-driven decisions are totally on the rise. Uh, these can be very threatening for us because there's a lot of big data stuff um, and a lot of, frankly, nonsensical analysis going on. Uh, but the point they're making, which is decisions should be made more on the basis of information and uh, data rather than passion, uh, is one we're very much aligned with. And we, we know a lot about what kind of data analysis it takes to make something uh, really successful and bring a decision home. So this is another huge trend. Um, another one and, uh, is the ubiquity of Excel as a business language. And this is a this is a bit of a subtle point, but when I started my career, one of the things that made me valuable was that I could use uh, spreadsheets. And um, and that was an alien thing to people. And you'd show up in a business meeting and you'd show somebody Excel and they'd be like, oh, wow, that's so cool. I'm very impressed. Well, that's completely different now. Um, you can go to almost any manager in any business. And if you want to talk about something quantitative or something about forecasting or modeling, the common denominator language is Excel. You can put it in Excel, and people will communicate it to understand it. It's the, it's the language of numeracy in organizations, and it has become totally established. Now, people are certainly using other kinds of quantitative tools, and that's all good and interesting, but the, the Excel has really established a ubiquity or, a, or a, a, a level set that pretty much everybody owns. And so one of the things I'm trying to do in, in helping our community move forward is, is to really embrace this. So, um, and this comes to another place where I can, I could use your help. Um, SmartArg has developed a new product called Wrangle. Its purpose is to tame spreadsheets, uh, radically transform spreadsheets for more powerful decisions. So we're using spreadsheets as inputs and then adding a kind of decision analytic layer on them to make them more collaborative, more dynamic, more trustworthy, and less frustrating. 
and uh, this lets you model in Excel and deploy in Wrangle. So uh, if you have the, uh, uh, we take a project evaluation spreadsheet you might be using or a business investment spreadsheet, um, you, and these things are everywhere in organizations, then Wrangle lets you collect, integrate, analyze them all online. It can scale to many users. It can automatically track updates. Um, I'm going to jump of oh, develop and compare scenarios, so which is a very decision analytic sort of thing, aggregate, and then add uncertainty and optimization analytics. That's sort of code for doing decision analysis. So it takes a spreadsheet and it will run a tornado on it without requiring the uh, a user to really understand much of that, uh, create and manage portfolios. So it's a tool designed to bridge this gap between ordinary users who just want to get on with their job and put information in and see results, and, and the more analytical users who want to design models and make sure that the quality stuff gets done. And uh, I'm sure there are many people moving in this kind of direction, but um, I'm really committed to making decision analysis a powerful force in the 21st century. Um, I'm working on innovating the tools to help embedded decision analysis be possible. Totally need your help getting it right. Uh, wrangles and data. I'd love people to use it, and if you are interested, um, I'd love to get people to try it out and give us feedback. I'd also like to collect examples of embedded decision analysis and other large-scale implementations. So if you do have a case, please contact me, um, and uh, I, I think we can move our way forward. As I say, I can, I can see a future dimly. I think we're a community that um, uh, needs a new... What's the right word? Needs, needs to scale, and uh, I'm I'm very excited about the possibility of really changing the world, and moving from mere impact, which is great, to to real transformation. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to questions. Thanks, David. Uh, we have quite a few, but um, as I pass these on to you, I encourage our other listeners to go ahead and type in your questions as uh, we uh, answer our first few. Uh, the first one is, uh, given human psychological weakness in making decisions, embedding DA into a process can only go so far in creating good decisions and valuable results. Shouldn't embedding DA into how we do things transition the DA consultant into a DA coach? Someone that doesn't go away. I think we talked about that. Oh, you're right. You're right. I'm, I'm sorry. I, we did that one already. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, here's one. Uh, and this is not from Ralph Keeney, oh, by the way, David. Uh, this one is, could we change our name from decision to value analysis? Um, I don't know. I, I did, decision analysis has a pretty reasonable brand. I mean, in spite of my critical comments, um, you know, people know more or less what it is. And I think value analysis would uh, it would require rebranding and, and get you um, – yeah, I, I don't know. That's I, I don't think I'm smart enough to figure that out on the fly. Okay. Uh, but I'm not I'm not too worried about our our sort of brand name. Okay. It does kind of focus on what you're what, what you were saying earlier about your talking about what's important to the decision maker, their results and their values is is what they're they're yeah. all. Yeah. No, I, I I get it. There's something to it. In fact, I have come to call uh, influence diagrams I found didn't didn't get as much traction as I'd like, and so I start calling them value maps, and it's sort of very much in the same spirit when I've talked with people who are sort of ordinary business. Well, you've got to map out how your business creates value. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. okay. Right? And um, that's an influence diagram. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, one of our uh, listeners is uh, interested in what kind of reference material or books that you would recommend on decision analysis. Uh, well, of course, the best book ever written about decision analysis is my book, The Smart Organization. <laughs> that goes without saying. Uh, yeah, goes without, oh, yeah, I guess I didn't have to say that. No, um, there are many good ones. Um, uh, I, I've always liked the one that uh, McNamee and Salona wrote, a very practical mm -hmm. kind of uh, decision analysis for the professional book. Uh, something that has more of this kind of flavor in it is... Yeah, I think that's uh, what they were getting at. Yeah, there was the one edited by Ward Edwards. Um, he unfortunately passed away before it was published, and I'm just trying... I'm, I've opened my bookshelf. I'm trying to find it, if you remember the name of it. Uh, and there is a section on more organizationally, on more organizational orientation in decision analysis there. Um, 
but maybe maybe someone can type it in if they know the name of this into the Q and A box. Ah, it's called Advances in Decision Analysis: okay. Foundation to Applications, and there are a couple chapters. I mean, it's got the usual stuff about different ways people do things, but there are some chapters in there around um, uh, thinking about kind of the organizational deployment mm -hmm. of decision analysis. And I, this may actually be the place where Jim and I coined the word embedded decision analysis. We were sort yeah. of halfway. And uh, by the way, um, your, your dad also just mentioned in the comment section that we sometimes use value-based management. This is getting back to the previous question about decision yes. or, or value. Yes. Yeah. Um, here's a, a, a comment, not a question, uh, from one of our listeners. Uh, there may be some lessons learned on how we've taken other functions and capabilities and embedded them in the corporate culture. For example, Lean Sigma, HES, project management. In our case, executive leadership expectations and reinforcements was critical. So that's a comment. I don't know if you have any reaction to that. Um, well, a lot of these things, uh, these management movements are, are delivering results. And once management believes that that instituting a program um, is going to make them heroes in terms of their financials and meeting their objectives, they, they kind of get behind it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we've ever held out that promise, or uh, maybe occasionally we have, but um, it's not something well, we when you when you talk about promise, though, are you actually promising that they will get good results? Well, so there's a um, – I, I profoundly believe that if you are more systematic around your major decisions, you will get better results. But that's on average. But you can't guarantee results in any one question right. on any one right. decision. Mm -hmm. that's, that's right. Um, but I wouldn't make a big point out of that. I think our philosophy gets in our way. I see. Mm -hmm. So, so think about think about the distinction. Uh, I don't know between intention and and maybe goals, right? So, it's my intention to make a difference for somebody, and in terms of delivering better results. And if I can't do it, I've fallen short. Mm -hmm. um, now, I have some tools that make this distinction between decisions and outcomes, but the people people already understand it. They already understand that you can only do as good as you can and that you're going to get – but they do understand you're going to get measured by results and there will be consequences for not delivering. And, you know, if I go to a sort of philosophical level of this, it's it's very important to be uh, – what's the word for this? Um, maybe equanimous, you know, not, mm -hmm. not too upset if stuff doesn't work out the way you'd hoped. And that's all good. But it's not something we need to rub people's noses in. They want better results. Right. I'm I'm committed to delivering, and I'm going to do my best, right? And of course, I might fail, right? And, yep. and that doesn't weaken my promise. Absolutely. Well, um, I think that uh, reaches the end of our time, uh, David. This has been a very thought-provoking uh, conversation. And on behalf of the society and the program council, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and talking to our membership today. Thank you. You're uh, you're very welcome, and I hope uh, at least some of you are starting to think differently and uh, will join me in trying to define decision analysis for the 21st century so that we can we can really change the world. Okay. Back to you, Hilda. Well, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's learning exchange. I'd like to thank our presenters for their time and contribution to today's event. We hope you found this webinar informational. Our webinars are open to anyone without charge. They are free because of the support of those who paid forward to enable you to attend. To continue the change of giving and to ensure we can continue this open access webinar series, we invite you to pay it forward and support our next webinar. You may do so via the link on our website at decisionprofessionals.com. I want to remind you that you can download a copy of today's presentation by clicking on the handout icon in the upper right of the menu bar, selecting the file, and clicking download. Alternatively, you may select from the bottom right menu, print to PDF. Thank you for being with us today, and you may now disconnect.